It's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Payam Zaran, who will uh, introduce our first keynote speaker. Over to you, Payam. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. I'm Payam Zarin. I'm joining you from Boston, Massachusetts. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome my forever mentor, my PhD, former PhD advisor, Dr. J.C. Zuniga Fluker. Uh, Professor Zuniga Fluker is the chair of the Department of Immunology at the University of Toronto, as well as a senior scientist at Sunnybrook Research Institute in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. He is one of the foremost uh, researchers in the field, field of thymic development, T-cell development. Uh, early on, he had some seminal papers uh, regarding role of IL-1-alpha, TNF-alpha and thymocyte differentiation, CD8 positive selection, among many more uh, important works, helping us understand how T-cells come to develop from stem cells. A field that has rightfully grown into one of the most uh, important avenue, avenues of uh, developing the next round of therapeutics in biotech, uh, which is also relevant to his work outside of academia at Nash Therapeutics, which is working to bring uh, these discoveries in science to patients and better lives of many uh, suffering with various uh, ailments that can benefit from T cells. So with that, I will pass on to JC, who will present from stem cells to T cells, applications and implications. Thank you for joining us today. Many thanks, uh, Payam, and many thanks to the Beyond Science Initiative, which as head of the Department of Immunology, I've been very proud and, and, and delighted to support over the years. Now, oh, I am allowed to share. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so this morning uh, and afternoon and evening for the rest of the world, uh, it, it's wonderful to be with you and to tell you about some of the work that we have been doing in the lab to try to better understand T-cell development and, and with that, uh, find ways to, to make T-cells in a clinically relevant way, as Payam pointed out. Got that, trying to get myself organized here. And off we go. One more. Right. So title of today's talk is from stem cells to T cells, applications and implications. And his subtitle uh, is thymic stromal cells are plastic. And this work, uh, is mainly uh, performed by a uh, graduate student in the lab, uh, Ashlyn Trotman Grant, uh, working with a senior research associate, Mahmoud Mutashami. And, and the reason that the subtitle is important, it has to do with uh, this um, scene here from the graduate where, where Ashlyn Trotman, depicted here by, um, by Dustin Hoffman, is, being, is getting some important advice about the future of his life. As pointed out by Payam, a few disclosures. Uh, I am a co-founder of Notch Therapeutics, um, chair of the Scientific Advisory Board, and we received some support from them. So to set the, the stage of what I will be talking about today, um, it all starts and has to do with T-cell development as it happens within the specialized organ of the thymus, which is depicted in this cartoon uh, showing its its cortical region and its medullary region, wherein in between progenitors derived from the bone marrow enter. And these early lymphoid progenitor cells make contact with thymic epithelial cells, as key stromal cells in the thymus, where they receive key signals for them to become T cells. And these key signals, as we'll highlight, are dependent on the notch pathway. Those signals induce those cells to become T lineage committed, they undergo rearrangement of their T-cell receptors, TCR beta genes and gamma delta TCRs for that lineage. And following proper beta rearrangement, they become uh, CD4, CD8 double positive cells, 
which then undergo alpha rearrangement and if able to recognize MHC, are able to be positive selected into the medullary compartment where then they are tested for self-reactivity. And if self-reactive are, are deleted, if not, they're able to mature and then exit into the periphery as mature T cells. And this process takes a couple of weeks and it has stage specific geographically dependent events that take place as pointed out by that migration through the different areas of the thymus. And it's all uh, fueled by rare cells entering from the bone marrow. And these are these thymic exceeding progenitor cells that are infrequent and enter the thymus, but they have the capacity upon notch signaling and cytokine support to undergo many rounds of division and give rise to about 4,000 cells as they divide all the way up to the double negative three stage where they're being tested for their ability to undergo beta selection, TCR beta rearrangement. Following that uh, successful rearrangement, they undergo another 250 fold expansion, which gives you 1 million cells per one TSP entry cell. So it's a dramatic uh, expansion that takes place early on prior to the uh, culling that takes place during positive and negative selection for testing out whether those TCRs are going to be useful. That's one aspect that I want to highlight, this sort of dynamic process that takes place in the thymus. And the other idea is that this all uh, requires this continuous seeding from the bone marrow as a progenitor needs to enter the organ to fuel the generation of T cells. That is because the thymus does not have its own stem cell. Unlike the bone marrow that has a self-renewing stem cell, the, uh, the thymus requires ongoing input. And the other aspect of thymus biology that's interesting to point out is that as we age, uh, the thymus function declines. There's thymic atrophy uh, mediated by uh, many mechanisms. And this impacts uh, in the clinic as it affects how patients undergoing bone marrow transplantation are unable to, to give rise to new T cells effectively because of the atrophy associated with, with the thymus and other defects that take place uh, due to the conditioning regimens that are given to these patients. So those are the two ideas that I want you to have in mind. And this is why in our lab, for many years, we focused on, on what happens to the thymus. And this is a, a view of, of the thymus by immunofluorescence, where you can see the, the medullary compartment and the cortical region. So you have a view of, of the cartoon version and, and, the, and the actual histological analysis. So our lab was very much focused for many years on, on these lymphoid progenitor cells and how we can perhaps be able to, to make more of them and to take advantage of their biology to, to fuel the process of making new T cells within this organ. And to, 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 to that effect, we, we many years ago now discovered a key role for the notch, uh, notch ligand interactions as the ones that predicate the main role of the early events that take place in the thymus such a way that it is the delta-like molecules, delta-like four expressed on thymic epithelial cells that are the ones that are inducing the T cell commitment through notch receptors on those cells. And we managed to replicate a lot of thymic biology, taking advantage of a simple cell line, OP9s, which are a bone marrow-derived stromal cell, that if we give them the expression of delta-like four or delta-like one initially, those cells are able to, to mimic what happens in the thymus. You have now here a progenitor cell undergoing interactions with a OP9 stromal cell shown here. And that interaction, again, in the dynamic fashion, is able to, to turn on the pathway and, and make those cells become T cells. So what's important about uh, notch signaling, and, and I'm gonna highlight some of those aspects in this cartoon, is that it's um, a way that two cells talk to each other. It's a way that cell-cell uh, contact initiates a receptor ligand interaction that then leads to direct transcriptional control of that signal receiving cell to alter its, its transcriptional makeup. So it's a very straightforward way to go from the cell surface to the nucleus and affect the lineage commitment capacity and regulation of that cell. So it all starts with the thymic epithelial cells expressing the notch ligand delta like four engaging the notch receptor on the progenitor cell, which is a 
surface receptor that is also at the same time a transition factor that is tethered to the receptor uh, as shown here. This is the intercellular portion of notch acts as a transition factor itself. And the sensing occurs when the ligand that interacts with the receptor undergoes constant endocytosis into the cell. And this constant endocytosis into the cell creates a pulling force on the receptor. And this pulling force then allows the receptor to be um, extended in a way that a region within the proximal transmembrane region here is able to be um, acted upon by metalloproteases that cleave the receptor. And that cleavage event allows the receptor to be internalized. And upon internalization, the nuclear localization sites in the receptor allow it to go into the nucleus, where it then associates with a DNA binding protein called RBPJ in mice or CBF1 in humans. And that DNA binding protein on its own is unable to activate transcription, but when associated with the notch intercellular portion plus associated transactivators, it's able to turn on gene expression. So you can see how a cell surface event shown here on the left leads to the activation event uh, on, at the nuclear level. And it's a direct uh, effect, uh, unlike all the receptor ligand interactions that require multiple uh, downstream um, uh, factors uh, or, 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 or secondary events. Here is a linear event from mem membrane to nucleus. So knowing how the pathway works, what we have to focus our attention is, is the necessary idea that it's a mechanosensing uh, receptor that it requires this mechanical force to induce the cleavage of the receptor to en enable to, to act. And obviously the OP9 Delta system was able to do that, uh, given that it's a live cell uh, with a, a Delta like four B endocytos and able to, to induce signals. And we showed that if we put in human hematopoietic progenitors derived from umbilical cord samples, uh, that these CD34 positive, 38 positive cells could be induced to develop into T cells. And this system also gives us a window of opportunity where the cells can be modified, tested, uh, analyzed, and are harvested for different uh, ideas. For instance, to enable us to produce progenitor T cells for immune reconstitution, or to have the cells given a TCR or a CAR uh, to allow for better immune uh, function or immune regulation. What we've shown uh, in the past is that the OP9 Delta system uh, can support T cell development quite readily from human uh, hemopoietic stem cells, and the functional T cells are generated. And many labs uh, around the world have, have uh, expanded on this on this research. And what I'll highlight briefly today is work that we've shown as well that in vitro derived T cell progenitors made on this system can also facilitate and improve hemopoietic stem cell derived engraftment within a host thymus. And this was uh, shown. Uh, through this workflow that I'm depicting here, where we take hemopoietic stem cells or stem cell enriched uh, uh, sorts, where you have C34 positive cells, or C38 negative from core blood samples. And these are cultured in vitro with the OP9 cells, uh, along with human cytokines like IL-7 and fifth ligand and stem cell factor to allow their differentiation into an early T cell progenitor state defined by the expression of the stem cell markers, CD34 and CD7, which is an early T cell marker. And these human progenitor T cells are then tested for their ability to, to engraft a, a mouse. In this case, we use uh, the not uh, skid common gamma chain deficient animals. Uh, and these are unirradiated to test their ability to home to the thymus directly. And what we noticed in earlier work was that this, although happens uh, in vivo, it is, it is enhanced when we give these animals human IL-7 that is complex to an uh, anti-IL-7 antibody to enable the mice, which typically have no human IL-7, to support human T-cell uh, differentiation in, in, a, in, a, in a better way. And using this um, IL-7 addition, we can show that these animals uh, have robust T-cell generation within a short period of time. Uh, not scared gamma common chain animals um, have a delay in human T cell regeneration when only given hemopoietic stem cells. But here, by providing them with cells that are already on their way to becoming T cells, we can see that within a three week period, 
the thymus has uh, a large number of human um, lymphocytes, which are made up of, of CD4 single positive cells, which are expressing TCR on the surface, as well as CD8 single positive cells, which are expressing CD3 or TCR on the surface, as well as a large portion of double positive cells, which is the normal makeup of the thymus. So this gave us uh, the, the notion that these cells that are generated in vitro are, are able to potently uh, engraft the mouse thymus. So this is the work that we're pursuing uh, in the lab currently, that we, we, we know that these progenitor cells can engraft uh, young uh, animals, as shown in, in, in that slide, and they can also engraft uh, aged animals that are undergoing uh, clinically relevant um, conditioning regimens as patients would receive. So this gave us an idea that potentially these progenitor T cells could make a, a great cell therapy for, for individuals that, that need to have a regeneration of their immune system. And that work um, led us to develop new ways of making T cells that didn't require a two cell system. And that led to the, the discoveries that I'll share with you today that also led to the uh, foundation of much therapeutics. And it has to do with ways of making progenitor T cells that are uh, occurring in a, in a stromal cell free system. So to recap, we know that the notch pathway is important. I mean, we need the, the ligands to turn on the receptor to be engaged and cleaved. And then we know that the thymus uh, does an excellent job at this. The OP9 Delta-1 system does it as well. Unfortunately, it's a mouse-based system. And being a, a stromal system uh, that grows slowly, it's not a very robust way to, to induce this differentiation, although it happens very well. Other... Uh, Investigators on our cells uh, have shown that plate-bound versions of delta like 4 in an FC fusion can uh, induce T-cell development, uh, although it's, it's not a, a very scalable way of doing it, uh, but uh, it, it does occur. And we wanted to have a way that could be uh, more readily scalable and have a soluble version of this pathway uh, induce the receptor activation. But we found that purely soluble delta 4 FC is able to engage the receptor uh, as, a, as a ligand, but because it's unable and it's untethered to a cell or anything else, it's unable to pull on the receptor to induce its activation. In fact, it serves us in a way to inhibit the receptor when it's in a soluble form. And this led to the, to the work that uh, Ashton and Mahmoud uh, devised, where they thought, well, what if we then link the soluble EPSI to, to microparticles and maybe that way we can uh, develop a way to allow some force to be given to the uh, engagement of the receptor to turn on the pathway. And to do that, um, the way they went about this is to develop these Delta IV FC fusions that were biotinylated uh, at the FC end and then given to streptavid encoded beads of different sizes and then created a Delta IV uh, a nano or microparticle as a first generation approach. And we tested the functionality of this idea by using a cell line that has a notch responsive element driving the expression of luciferase. And we can look at luciferase, luciferase as a way to, uh, as a correlate of notch activation. And if you take those cells and give them uh, play bound immunoglobulins or, or, or basically unconjugated beads, um, we have no signal above background. But if we give them plate-bound Delta IV FC, uh, you can see uh, an upward activation of luciferase indicating that notch pathway has been turned on. We then tested this system for different size beads. And the idea was to, to have different uh, uh, beads that are um, uh, polystyrene-based um, linked through strep, uh, uh, through avidin to the biotinylated uh, FC delta four to see whether they can induce T cell activation. And to our surprise, when we used uh, beads in the nano size uh, air, uh, read, uh, range, uh, none of them were able to activate. So very small bead microparticles don't show activation. Beads in the in the smaller micro uh, nanometer side micro uh, side 
uh, don't do it either. Large beads don't seem to do it as well, but there was a particular range of size beads between 10 to 25 that is able to show uh, a remarkable activity. And, and we were quite pleased with the fact that there is this, this, this Goldilocks area where, where the beads can enable enough force on the um, cells to activate the pathway. So given that we had now a, a, a cell-based solution, soluble system to turn on the pathway, we asked, can, can this work with hemopoietic stem cells? And we first started using mouse uh, hemopoietic stem cells. These are lineage negative, uh, kid positive, uh, SCA1 positive cells that we then cultured in vitro with supporting cytokines and beads at different uh, ratios, like one to one beads or three to one or nine to one or lots, lots of beads. Uh, and we show, uh, in contrast to unconjugated, meaning non-delta bearing beads, which uh, are then uh, tested for their ability to, to give rise to T cells. And in, 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 in mice, T cells are first able to uh, induce high levels of, of Phi1 or CD90, and then uh, turn on the expression of CD25 as they differentiate through the double negative stages. And you can see that none of that happens in the absence of delta four conjugation, but when we give them beads, uh, different ratios that we see a robust um, generation of these Phi1 positive, CD25 positive cells, which are early uh, T cells. The other aspect of notch signaling that is important is that it's not only able to induce T cell differentiation, but also it's able to inhibit alternate lineages that normally uh, would be derived from a hemopoietic stem cell, like a generation of myeloid lineage cells or B lymphocytes which happen in the bone marrow, as opposed to the thymus, where uniquely mixed T cells. As you can see that the unconjugated beads uh, can give rise to B cells, as depicted by CD19 positive cells in these conditions, and myeloid lineage cells, as seeing all these um, uh, MAC1 or cd 11 B positive cells. But as soon as you give them the beads uh, that they're engaged in the notch receptor, we lose the, the presence of B cells and, and, and myeloid lineage cells Again, key features of notch signaling. If you wait a bit longer, over seven days shown here to, to uh, uh, nearly a month in vitro, these cells continue to differentiate and begin to give rise to both CD4 and CD8 uh, double positive cells and eventually give rise to some CD8 single positive cells which uh, express uh, T cell receptor on the surface. So just beads with um, Delta four alone uh, and the appropriate cytokines, again, IL-7, substitute factor, and ligin, are able to turn on the pathway and support the differentiation of T cells through a progenitor state, through an immature state, and all the way to a TCR-bearing um, functional CD8 T cell. We then ask, can this be done with human stem cells? Uh, and these are hemopoietic you know, stem cells from, again, cord blood samples as CD34 positive CD38 negative uh, cells that are lineage uh, gated. And then again, over time with beads that are of the right size and bearing uh, Delta IV, we can see that in contrast to the unconjugated beads where differentiation is shown by the CD34 positive cells uh, that are able to gain expression of this key T cell marker CD7, which does not happen in the unconjugated situation, but it's able to happen very quickly as soon as two days when they're co-culture with delta four beads. And this increases over time. And eventually they begin to lose expression of CD34 as they gain expression of other T cell markers that are occurring later in differentiation like, like CD5. And this continues on over the shown here the first two weeks where the cells are undergoing more and more differentiation, getting to express CD5 and even later markers like CD1A. And this is taking place uh, in contrast to when you don't have notch signaling. And we compare this to plate-bound Delta IV uh, at the same time at day 14, and you can see that it is able to give some CD7 expression and moving on to the expression of CD5, but it's not as, as robust as, or as scalable as the, the bead-based approach. We also um, 
wanted to 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 show that this system is able to expand as the cells differentiate towards the distal lineage. So you see this this hundreds of fold expansion over time of cells that are uh, becoming early T cells or progenitor T cells akin to those cells that are in the thymus entering early on and, and becoming T cells. So we wanted to ask, well, can these cells in fact act like early progenitor T cells? And to that end, we took the human hemophilic stem cells, culture them with this defined um, media, which is uh, serum-free, um, bead-based, animal-free products uh, in, 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 in suspension and show that over time, again, these are uh, day uh, 12 cultures, we can isolate the CD34, CD7 positive cells and give them to the not skid common gamma chain division animals with a bit of human IL-7 to en enable their engraftment and then test them over time. And by four weeks, again, we can see that a large fraction of the, of the human thymus is uh, filled with, uh, uh, so the, well, the mouse thymus is filled with human cells. Uh, here are human CD45. Uh, there are CD4 and CD8 uh, bearing cells, and they're not making myeloid or, or B lineage cells. And if you look at, at, at the mice a bit later in their spleens, we can see that they have CD4 and CD8 uh, single positive cells. So they're able to exit the thymus and, and look like mature T cells in the periphery. And in fact, uh, they are expressing CD4, um, TCR in the surface, CD3 and alpha uh, beta. And if you take those cells and, and in vitro uh, culture them with uh, anti CD3, anti CD28 antibodies uh, to, us, to stimulate them, uh, in contrast to the un unsimulated cells, the T cells are able to, to express interferon gamma. And, and TNF alpha indicating their functionality as mature T cells. So we can go from a stem cell in vitro through these big base delta IV system to a progenitor cell that is readily able to engraft any animal, which then quickly is able to allow for the reemergence of, of T cells within that animal, which is exactly what's missing in patients that are uh, given a bone marrow transplant, this rapid regeneration of new T cells. We also wanted to know whether we can expand this ability to make new T cells to, in essence, the ultimate stem cell, uh, pluripotent stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells as a source of infinite amount of stem cells. And to do that, we took advantage of a protocol that was co-developed with a Cordon Keller's lab, uh, where we can uh, take pluripotent stem cells, generate embryo bodies, and those are then able to give rise to early hemogenic endothelial cells defined as CD34 positive cells. And these CD34 positive cells that are coming out of these uh, embryo bodies after eight days are able to then be given those uh, delta IV beads to begin the induction of T cell differentiation from these hemogenic cells. And you can see that after seven days of culture, again, the key markers, uh, CD34 and CD7, show that those cells are undergoing differentiation into the T cell lineage and over time uh, give rise to some, the expression of, of CD5 as well. It's a bit delayed because these are again, uh, really early stem cells compared to you know, hemopotic stem cells. But as you will see over time, these cells develop into the T cell lineage. So early on, they're just becoming progenitors. And if we look at them over time, uh, from three weeks uh, onwards, you see that the expression of CD5 is uh, increased over time as they become more and more T lineage committed, uh, as well as the expression of CD4 early on in humans, they become CD4 immature single positive cells, which then give rise to CD4, CD8 double positive cells shown here, and that these cells begin to gain the expression of T cell receptor alpha and the associated CD3 complex on the surface over time to generating uh, large numbers of double positive cells that have a TCR and eventually give rise to CD8 single positive cells. And again, the kinetics and the, uh, and the um, replicants are shown on the right on these, uh, on these uh, dot graphs. So the last thing I want to share with you is the fact that we can not only take advantage of, of induced pluripotent stem cells derived from, from uh, fibroblasts as shown in the last slide and shown here in this IPS11, 
but if you use a, a former T cell that was made into an IPS C, so it already has a pre rearranged CCR receptor, and these uh, T cell IPS cells can also be re programmed back into the T cell lineage. And when you do that, uh, because these cells already have a rearranged T cell receptor, uh, they undergo the differentiation pathway with a faster kinetics. As you can see here, Early on, they look very similar in terms of the expression of CD4 and CD8, but by day 28, these are already uh, becoming double positives and, and very readily becoming uh, more so uh, over time. And what really striking is that even as early as day 21, the, the cells that are already pre rearranged, they already show expression of a T cell receptor on the cell surface compared to fibroblast cells that are becoming T cells that have to, you know, de novo rearrange the T cell receptor. In, in a functional way. So these guys have a, a major advantage in terms of already having a predefined T cell receptor that one can take advantage of if you know its specificity. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll conclude sort of the, this, this overview of what the lab is about in terms of trying to make new T cells for uh, therapeutic purposes. Uh, and now having developed uh, what I call a super simple and remarkably easy way to make T cells, which is basically you have uh, delta-4 beads, stem cells, uh, put them in culture, you have T cells made out of that. And the one word that was given uh, to the characters, some of you know, in this movie is plastics, because the delta-4 beads are, are polystyrene-based, and basically that's a form of plastic, and that that way we have a very easy way to take advantage of the, of the facility to use different types of beads and, and, and notch ligands to make different stem cells become not only progenitor T cells in vitro for reconstitution of thymus, but also the generation of T cells entirely uh, in, in vitro for, for different uh, applications. And of course, because of the flexibility of the approach, we can use different combinations of receptor ligand interactions on those beads beyond Delta IV to enable different functional programming of developing T cells in vitro. And that's ongoing work uh, that we're developing in the lab. So in essence, what I've shown you is that uh, progenitor cells made in vitro can be used uh, to more quickly reestablish T cell functionality in a hematopoietic stem cell transplant setting. And then we can differentiate T cells in vitro as well. And I'd like to thank uh, again, uh, the amazing work by Mahmoud Motashami and Ashton Trump, Ashton Trump and Grant uh, that made this, this, this work happen with a lot of uh, help from previous work uh, from the, in, in the lab from, uh, from Jesse Singh and Jenev A. Wong, as well as Elisa Martinez uh, on the work with the induced pluripotent stem cells, great colleagues, uh, funding sources, and all of you around the world for your attention. Uh, it's been a pleasure to, to engage with you already. So many thanks. Thank you very much, JC, for the brilliant talk. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. It was great to hear uh, the updates on the exciting work by Ashton Mahmoud and others. I have one or two questions myself as well. I believe we have some questions in the panels. We'll get through as many of them as possible. Uh, I'm wondering uh, in terms of the approach you just described, if you could comment on two things. One, the importance uh, of having an allogenic cell therapy approach, which I think this enables. And on the other hand, if you could also comment the, um, you know, efforts to ensure that the cells don't have the potential to transform since you're beginning from stem cells as opposed to more differentiated cells. All right, those are excellent questions, Payam. Um, the, you're right, the idea behind going to an pluripotent stem cell is, is, is the ability to more readily genetically man manipulate that, that cell to make it allo-friendly so you can remove MHC mole HLA molecules at uh, other molecules that would uh, allow them to be less likely to be recognized um, as, as allo. And that's work that is ongoing uh, by Notch and others. And I think that's, that's a key aspect of not having to, to pre-match when you're doing it from you know, body stem cells that they can be done. And that's work that uh, we, we want to pursue anyhow because it's still an, a, a, an easier approach because it doesn't deal with the second question you had, which is how do you ensure that your pluripotent stem cells are going to be uh, in a way safe by having them directed their differentiation forward. 
So one aspect is that we know that as they differentiate into T cells, they, they stop having that uh, IPS-like uh, behavior of the able to give potentially teratomas in, in, in animals. So we, we feel that they are, they are differentiated enough back to T cells that this is not a concern, but the idea would be always to have some sort of uh, kill switch built into this system to, to disallow any, any reversion back to uh, pluripotent state if that's possible. Um, but that's, this, it is a, a, one of the uh, dualities of having this you know, infinite source of stem cells, and yet uh, that itself has that, that worrisome ability that you can develop something that would be uh, too good at, at the end. I, I see, thank you for the uh, answer, that was great. I, I see also from the questions that Pavan Raj had a similar question as I did, so I won't repeat that particular question, but Ashwini asks, uh, about the potential to uh, use this approach to treat leukemia or uh, other types of cancers. Right. I mean, uh, we've done some uh, work uh, in collaboration with uh, Marcel, Marcel Vandenbrink with the, in the mouse model system where we've given in vitro derived progenitor T cells um, chimeric antigen receptors against uh, leukemia antigens like CD19. And those car bearing progenitor T cells are able to differentiate in the thymus and come out very quickly as T cells and show potent uh, anti-leukemic effect. So Marcel's work really show that and paved the way to the idea that car bearing progenitor T cells could have this capacity. So uh, the answer is yes. And that's one of the aspects that one can apply the direct differentiation of, of early T cells for, for those therapeutic purposes. But also you can just wait longer in vitro and, and make a, a fully formed T cell that can have that, that capacity as well. Uh, and just two more quick questions from the audience so far. One is from Pavan Raj who asks um, how you could, for example, push cells towards memory T cells and how you can ensure that you don't have any, uh, you know, autoreactive T cells that are produced through the right. pipeline. Great question. So when we do a lot of the work on the progenitor T cell side of things, uh, these cells are uh, cells that have not yet rearranged their own receptors. So they are early in the, in the pathway of becoming a T cell. And by not having a TCR yet, they are not graft uh, versus host disease um, enabling cells. So that's, that's one way to get around that problem. But of course, if you make a fully mature T cell, it will have some T cell receptor. And I think the way to, to go around that problem is by either using a former T cell that you remake into an IPS and you have a defined specificity that you know what it is, that will prevent it from being a GBHD uh, uh, possible cell. Or you can use uh, cells that you've removed their capacity to rearrange. Uh, we've shown that we can use pluripotent stem cells, remove the RAG2 gene, and you can make T cells um, with an, a newly added TCR that way. So you can have ways that you can manipulate the cells so you don't have them uh, carrying on their, you know, unselected TCL repertoire, which in fact will be the case if you allow T cells to develop entirely in vitro. They will have a, a large repertoire that likely is uh, 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 self-reactive because there's not the same restriction and, and constriction of the repertoire that happens in the thymus that doesn't, will not be happening in, in vitro. And I suppose there's still some work to be done because of the limitations to the load we can give the cells with, you know, uh, viruses and so on at this point for editing them. Uh, last question is from Gilbert who asks, what about the influence of cytokines and endocrine pathways of the natural thymic environment? Uh, what's the focus on recapitulating those? Ah, great. Another great question. Part of our, our, our hopes uh, and, and the reasons we focus our attention on the progenitor side of things is that those cells, when they enter the thymus through the crosstalk of the developing T cells with the epithelial cells and the other stromal cells in the thymus are able to, to alter and sort of restructure the thymus to, to be more um, uh, like it was in, 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 in a young setting. So the all the pathways that are you know, deteriorating over time in the thymus that disallow effective new T cell development can be, in a way, restarted by inputting a fresh set of, of, of 
early T cells into the organ, which is a remarkable um, repair mechanism that the organ has and, and something that we think we can take advantage of clinically. Thank you so much, AC. Uh, Eleanor, do you have any additional questions? No, that was an outstanding talk. Thank you so much, JC. Really appreciate Thank your time. I believe you're even up earlier than we are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> but delighted to be uh, in, in this conference and so wonderful to be part of it. Really wonderful, wonderful to have you and uh, thank you for your talk and hope to see you soon again. Same here. Have a great weekend. Thanks to all.